Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Good morning and happy Friday to you. You're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines. US President Donald Trump has apparently signed off on the Phase 1 trade deal with China. While terms have been agreed upon, the legal text is yet to be finalised. In the UK, Boris Johnson is on course for a decisive victory in the elections. The official exit polls predict the Conservatives will win 368 out of the 650 seats in the House of Commons. The European Central Bank keeps interest rates unchanged. Pres uh, President Christine Lagarde says that the Eurozone economy is showing signs of bottoming out. India's retail inflation surges to a three-year high in November. Industrial output contracts for the second month in a row, but lesser than feared. And President Ramnath Kovind has given his assent to the Citizenship Amendment Bill. The legislation, as you know, was cleared by both houses of the par Parliament earlier this week. Now, after months of flip-flops and uh, negotiations, U.S. President Donald Trump has apparently signed off on the first phase of the trade deal between the U.S. and China. And this comes just ahead of the December 15 deadline when U.S. was set to impose fresh tariffs on China in case a deal was not signed. Jody Schneider of Bloomberg News gets you all the details. Well, uh, people familiar with this have told us that President Trump has signed off on uh, this phase one deal that we've been talking about that he's been saying uh, is close since October. Mm. This basically, um, what we're being told, this would uh, avert those December 15th tariffs on, a, on another $160 billion in Chinese goods. Those would not take effect, uh, that China would be buying more agricultural goods from the U.S. and would be making some commitments on intellectual property uh, rights and the U.S. would look at rolling back some of those previous tariffs. Uh, we have not yet heard from China on this. Uh, there is a nine o'clock event where the Chinese foreign minister will be. It's mm. not a trade event, but um, it would be an opportunity to say something about this deal. Uh, uh, President Trump tweeted yesterday that there would be a very big deal uh, being announced. Of course, we don't expect a big deal. We, this phase one deal was always supposed to be about ending the next round of tariffs mm. and trying to get some of those commitments on more purchases from China mm. of agricultural goods. All right, let's uh, take a look at the latest in the Asia-Pacific region with regard to the markets. Rosalind Chin is joining us from the Bloomberg Studios in Hong Kong. Morning, Rosalind. So positive uh, cues from overseas, not just uh, news on the signing of the agreement, also the markets uh, mm. in the U.S. having ended positively. I think across the board there's positivity this morning. You're absolutely right. You know, Friday the 13th, unlucky for some, lucky for others. Um, this time around, really a lot of positivity on the board, a lot of uh, risk creeping back into the market, I have to say. And you know, who would know that so many events were going to happen on the same day? Of course, we knew that the uh, UK elections were going to happen. Uh, we're seeing at the moment uh, exit polls pointing to a majority and for the Tories and, of course, them increasing their majority as well. And that, of course, had Sterling on the move, uh, jumping to the highest in uh, more than 19 months, I believe, at one point. Uh, and also, of course, this trade deal. So all, a lot of options feeding back into the markets. We've got the MSCI Asia Pacific up by 1.4% right now. Uh, pretty much all the markets, uh, major markets in the region uh, pointing in the same direction. So Nikkei up by more than 2%, 2.3% right now. Topics up by 1.5% uh, set for its biggest gain in more than three months. Now, of course, after this trade deal, we've got the um, US uh, dollar Japan yen at 109.49 right now. Uh, we did get some eco data, though, out from Japan. Uh, the Tanken, the BOJ's Tanken, now, that actually slipped from 5 to 0, which was a lot more than uh, a slide than expected. And in fact, uh, economists had been forecasting that gauge to come in at 3. Now, this looks at the sentiment of big manufacturers and uh, producers in Japan. So that was a bit of a surprise. This worsening sentiment could weigh, of course, on future investment plans. However, looking a little bit more deeply into the data, we did see that sentiment at large factories outside the fa um, at large companies outside the factory sector held up better than expected and capital spending plans on from those edged up last quarter so not all bad and perhaps this trade data this trade deal rather that's come through 
uh, this, uh, before uh, the December 15th deadline, we'll see uh, some bit more uh, positivity, a bit more confidence coming back in the global economy as a whole, and of course Japan as well. We've got a BOJ uh, meeting, of course, next week, so uh, they'll be taking in this data as they make their assessments on um, what to do. Uh, also in the region, we've got uh, the uh, Shanghai Composite and Hang Seng Index both trading higher right now. Hang Seng in fact up by 1.89, or 1.86% right now. And Australia's S&P ASX 200 uh, making gains of 0.4%. So across the board, a lot of positivity. Can it hold out though uh, as we go through into 2020? And of course, with uh, uh, conservatives likely to win, uh, what will happen to its relationship with Europe and Brexit after that? Back to you. All right, thanks so much for that, Rosalind. Now, the sentiment, as Rosalind is saying, in the market is certainly risk on after the US China trade deal. According to uh, Mark Matthews of uh, uh, of Bank Julius Baer, that, that is the case. In fact, speaking to Bloomberg Television, Matthews said that the deal may result in a major rally in global equities. He also spoke about the details of the deal that may disappoint the market. Listen in. I think what this is going to do is, is uh, cause a really powerful rally into the year end. So what's going to be left over to get priced in in 2020, I'm not so sure. But, uh, you know, they say when it rains, it pours. And I don't know what the expression is for the opposite of that. But uh, clearly that's what's happened because um, the uh, UK election and Brexit, as well as the uh, trade war, the conflict between the US and China, were the two biggest things hanging over the markets. And those clouds are now lifting. Good morning from London, Mark. Let me ask you about where this does take the Fed. Picking up from what Sherry was saying there, the Fed needs uh, a big change for some kind of material re-evaluation of where the U.S. economy is. Uh, is a phase one deal enough for that? Do we start to see uh, a, a change in interest rates coming back onto the agenda for 2020? It's probably early days for that conversation now. I think it's slightly early days because this is a phase deal and of course there's there, there's there's two sides to the deal so the the part that China has agreed on which is large agricultural purchases I don't really think that's going to move the needle on the US economy opening up uh, China's uh, market to uh, US financial companies I don't think that's going to move the market on the US economy that much either but if we see uh, the same kind of payrolls that we saw last Friday a few more months of those then I think you could start to talk about maybe the Fed having to raise rates toward the end of next year. But that's still more than 12 months away. So I don't think it's going to spook the market. And what are your expectations then for when we see the details? Because we don't know the details of what is in this phase one deal. We just got a confirmation that the president has signed it, has accepted it. We've got a lot of tariffs to roll back. I asked this of a guest earlier. What would constitute disappointment for the markets, do you think, in terms of rolling back some of the existing tariffs? Well, one obvious disappointment is if it's just a head fake, and it was a tweet uh, that Donald Trump set out, uh, sent out at the spur of the moment. But I don't think so. I think I think something is happening, uh, and and the USMCA, uh, which uh, the Democrats have agreed to, it hasn't actually been approved by Congress yet, and 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 we're coming toward the end of the year, so that needs to be done quickly. And I think that getting Mnuchin and uh, Lighthizer back to to uh, Capitol Hill to work on that should be a priority, and and therefore. Uh, basically, not having to haggle uh, with China, they've got to they've got to just you know get the China thing done to go back and push USMCA through Congress by the end of the year. And it seems like all of this is is happening. You mentioned the Mexican Senate has has approved what they needed to do. So um, you know this doesn't already always happen, but uh, for whatever reason the stars are aligned and uh, market friendly uh, events uh, seem to be coming out uh, with uh, great rapid rapidity just in the last few hours. All right, on to the UK now, where exit polls suggest a big victory for Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party. Uh, if the exit polls are to be believed, Johnson is set for the biggest victory since the times of late Margaret Thatcher. Our Bloomberg team of reporters at Sebastian Salek, uh, Rodney Jefferson and Mario Tadeo uh, get you the complete roundup of the latest trends. What we're seeing is either the Tories taking the seats off Labour, we've had one so far and that's Blythe Valley, or we've seen a swing to the Tories and this is very much in line with the poll. But what it's doing is telling a story. It's telling a story of old allegiances that are being broken. They can't rely anymore, Labour can't rely on people in the North, people in the Midlands voting for their party anymore because they voted for Brexit back when they did and this seems to them now to be a more important thing. So it's really seeing a redrawing of the map. Now uh, we see 
seeing uh, all of these former safe seats for Labour. Not necessarily the case anymore. They want to see Brexit delivered. That's the message we're seeing. I'm going to show you this on the map now. If we can move over here. If you look up here in the northeast, you see Newcastle upon Tyne. That stayed Labour, but it's these swings of 10 or 11 percent that should really be concerning Labour HQ tonight. OK, thanks very much, Seb. Let's go to, to Rodney Jefferson now in Edinburgh. Uh, Rodney, your initial reaction to what we're seeing in the exit poll for Scotland, another good night for the SNP. Well, yeah, I mean, if the poll is correct, then um, it's an incredible night for the SNP. And interestingly, you're talking there about allegiances that have been torn up in England with uh, Blythe Valley going to Conservative. Um, in Scotland, it feels like if, if the exit poll is correct, then uh, allegiances have gone back to where they were a few years ago, uh, which is very much a case of uh, Scotland being completely different to the dynamic in, in the, the rest of the United Kingdom. So in 2017, if you remember, when it was a pretty bad night for Theresa May, um, it was a good night for the Conservatives in Scotland. Now it's the, the opposite. You seem to have a very good night for Boris Johnson, and yet in Scotland you have an incredibly good night for the SNP. Let's get to Maria Tadeo for some reaction from Brussels. Uh, interestingly, I see a, a, a headline across the Bloomberg, Maria, says the EU governments reach a consensus on climate policy, according to the EU Council. So uh, interesting results coming at this late hour in all different quarters. But let's stick with the Brexit story. What does this exit poll mean then for the Brexit process from the European perspective? Well, European leaders are still meeting here. There's a lot on the agenda, not Brexit, but of course they are keeping an eye on the results. And we did have an official, European officials tell us that if the uh, polls are confirmed and that is the result, this is in a way good news for the European Union because officials here have really wanted to get clarity from the UK. And one of the lines that we would often hear is that they wanted the United Kingdom to speak with one voice. And that obviously was a reference to the government, but also the UK Parliament and the uh, scenario here the European leaders are operating with or operating under is the fact that there will be now a Brexit deal, that this will be cleared finally by the UK Parliament in January and that the United Kingdom is leaving with a deal and that is good news because the EU always said they wanted this Brexit to happen with a deal. They wanted to avoid the chaos of a no deal Brexit. Now we do understand that European leaders are going to meet tomorrow again for day two of the summit and they want to come up with the stages for the second phase of the negotiation, which is, of course, a future relationship and the trade deal. And I have to say, when you speak to officials and the same official told us this, this is really what is matter or is crucial for the EU, the future relationship. This is what they think. It's fundamental. It's key going forward. Long term strategic priorities, getting this relationship correct. If anything, this was just phase one. This was just the easy start or the easy part of it. This is where negotiations could get really tricky because that trade relationship is crucial for the EU. They just want to make sure that they have a close relationship, but that they are not undercut by the UK. This is something I hear time after time. We do not want to be undercut by a UK that doesn't play by the rules, or our rules, I should say. Now, Bloomberg Network also spoke to Conservative Party Chairman James Cleverly, and here's what he had to say post the initial round of trends. Well, the first thing, as we've always, uh, the, the first thing we've said is to unite the country, we've got to get beyond this most divisive issue, which is Brexit. And we've always made the case that we want to get Brexit done so that we can set about that job of uh, reuniting the country, levelling up education, making sure feel, people feel uh, safe in their streets, secure in their jobs, with an economy that's growing and public services that work for them. That's that's the thing. It's 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 not the most. It's not the most complicated formula, but it's one that we know will work. Now, big uh, news headlines across the globe. Uh, Sue Keenan of Bloomberg News has the first word headlines. To start with the latest on impeachment proceedings in the U.S., sources in Washington say that an impeachment vote by the House of Representatives is being tentatively planned for next Wednesday. The White House says it remains in close contact with Senate Republicans, planning strategy in the event the House does vote to impeach President Trump. The president is due to hold a campaign rally in Michigan on the evening that the vote is scheduled to happen. 
To the ECB now, Christine Lagarde launched her term at the European Central Bank with an optimistic message, saying the Eurozone's economic slowdown is showing signs of bottoming out. Speaking after her first policy meeting, her comments suggest further rate cuts are unlikely in the foreseeable future. Even so, Lagarde released updated forecasts that show a muted outlook for growth. The euro jumped initially before pairing those gains. IPO for Saudi Aramco. It touched a valuation of $2 trillion briefly on day two of trading as a listed company. It finally mounted the kingdom's desired target. The total had become a point of pride for Riyadh and comes after skeptical international investors said that the company's true value is far lower. Aramco is said to be paying just $64 million to banks who arranged its IPO, roughly a quarter of 1% of the deal. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and a quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Sue Keenan. This is Bloomberg. So the signs are all there for a positive end to the week here in these markets as well. Uh, across the board, there's a risk on tone. Let's uh, go now to Agam Vakil, who's joining me to tell you all about the trade setup for the day and also what's happening in the futures and options space. Agam, uh, well, here we also have to factor in the economic data that came in yeah. uh, overnight rather in the evening, but positive data from overseas or sure. news from overseas. Right. Well, uh, always encouraging to see global yeah. queues, uh, you know, come and uh, be supportive. Uh, well, uh, the, the real question is where do we go from here? Uh, the SGX Nifty futures are certainly indicating a positive opening at this point in time, but we must consider the economic data. But, you know, as, as Alex uh, has mentioned right now, but, but the, the fact is that a lot of economic data, no matter how concerning it may be, it generally gets factored in very quickly as far as Indian equities are concerned. So let's talk about how things have panned out yesterday. We did see half percent gains. <clears throat> a lot of that had to do with uh, about a short covering day before, which was extended to longs building into the system. And we saw some strength come back to the mid cap and the small cap indices too. Uh, moving on to your, you know, your banking indices, it, the picture wasn't any different. We did see strength here as well. Uh, let's talk about how ADRs are, uh, how are doing right now. And some strength, which is you know, uh, evident across the board, specifically in case of Tata Motors and Vedanta, a lot of this has to do with the fact that they have a lot of exposure to the UK as well as Europe. Uh, and of course, save for that, we don't have too much going in for. But yesterday, it was essentially the stocks which had a global exposure, which led markets higher. Yet we had FIS sell into the equity markets to the tune of around 684 crores on a net basis. On the other hand, FIS buying stock worth 810 crores, again, on a net basis. <coughs> in terms of uh, contributors, we had three of the largest banks in India well, contribute to advances that, that would include HDFC Bank, Kotak Mandra Bank and State Bank of India. And of course, Tata Motors giving some help as well here. Not too much to speak for otherwise. We did see a little bit of weakness in the IT sector, Infosys and TCS. To, uh, to name. But uh, let's move on and talk about futures and options and that perhaps could be where things could have changed. So we saw fresh longs coming in. As far as the Nifty futures go, the Nifty banking futures also saw fresh longs. So some encouraging signs here. Let's wait and watch as to where things go and how things shape up here. Uh, well, we did see not too much change as far as your Oh, maximum open interest is input is concerns which stands at around 11,500 and of course on the higher end it is a 12,000 call which has uh, the uh, significant amount of open interest. Uh, again a lot of writing around the 11,900 uh, and 12,000 puts naturally because we saw the indices move higher and uh, moving on to your uh, WIX well that was relatively stable it is at significantly low levels anyways 13.3 uh, the bid put call ratio uh, on expected lines also moved moved up to around 1.5 from 1.2. And in terms of stocks, watching out for Power Grid, Apollo Hospitals, and IGL, uh, well, Yes Bank remains in the FNO band. And moving on to other stocks in terms of unwinding, HDFC Limited, Bajaj Finance, and Hexaware. Haven't seen too much change in the spot price, but there was unwinding all the same. Uh, reckon it will be about the indices, perhaps, Alex, about the UK elections and the kind of impact it has on the globe. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that, Agam.
All right, so uh, global news uh, likely to have a bearing on Indian markets at the end of the week, but also there's several stock-specific information that you need to know about. Yash Upadhyay is joining me now to tell you all about the stocks in news. Yash, morning, what's on your list today? Morning, Alex. So uh, I'll start first with the negative development that has come in for Dr. Reddy's, wherein uh, the, uh, the NYSE-based drug maker Amneel Pharma that has received the US FDA approval for the sale and marketing of the generic version of Merck and Company's Nuwa Ring. Now, Nuwa Ring's annual sales uh, in the United States uh, stand at close to around $976 million in the 12 month ended October, October 31st, according to IQVI data. Now, brokerages view this development as a negative. Uh, City, for one, says that this has a negative negative bearing for Dr. Reddy's, whose approval has been delayed potentially uh, to second half of calendar year 20. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch also said that if Teva uh, gets the approval ahead, uh, then uh, the estimates uh, for its F521 and F522 sales of close to around $50 million uh, could see some downward pressure coming in. Uh, next in the line is Tata Motors, wherein the promoter shareholding, uh, that is Tata Sun's shareholding, has increased from about 35.3% uh, to 39.5% uh, in the company according to uh, the exchange filing. Uh, I mean, uh, Florine would also be in focus after the company has bumped up its CAPEX plan uh, from about 90 crores uh, for the F4 FI20 to 450 crores uh, for its the H facility over the next three to four years. Uh, the, the said CAPEX would be for its fluorochemicals business, and the company said that it would be funding uh, the, the, the capital expenditure program through its internal accruals. Uh, that apart is another day, another downgrade coming in, and this time for Simplex infra where care ratings has downloaded uh, has downgraded the uh, banking facilities of the company uh, to default rating all cargo logistics that one has signed an, an agreement for a slump sale of some of its assets for a total consideration of about 108 crore rupees and lastly uh, positive news coming in for the aviation industry on the back of uh, the aviation data that has come in uh, for the month of November where the domestic air passenger traffic growth uh, that has grown in double digits for the first time since December of last year uh, in total, the Indian Airlines carried close to around 13 million uh, passengers, which is an 11.2% growth on a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, there has been substantial growth coming in for Indigo as well as SpiceJet. Uh, Indigo carrying almost 21% uh, more passengers over the same period last year, while SpiceJet saw a big jump of 43%. In terms of market share, however, Indigo's market share increased to 47.5%. On the other hand, SpiceJet market share dropped marginally uh, to 16.1% in the November period. Back to you. Thanks so much for that, Yash. Now, on to some big macro data that was released last evening. India's retail inflation for the month of November surged to a three-year high. The figure stood at 5.54%. And meanwhile, industrial output uh, contracted for the second straight month. But this was slower than uh, feared, the contraction. Uh, Pallavi Nahata has more in this report. Retail inflation surged to the highest in over three years in November because of a steep rise in the prices of vegetables such as onions and also pulses. This was according to data put out on Thursday by the Statistics Ministry. Data for industrial production was also released simultaneously and that showed a contraction for the second straight month with most segments registering a decline. Retail inflation jumped to 5.5% in November compared to a 4.6% increase in October. This was even higher than the estimate of 5.3% put out by the Bloomberg poll of 36 economists. The CPI food index surged 10% compared to 7.9% in the same period, largely because of vegetable prices, which increased by 36% on an annual basis. Core inflation also rose but very modestly from 34 to 3.5% as consumer demand continued to remain tepid. At current levels, inflation has stayed above the midpoint of India's 4 plus or minus 2% target for the second straight month. Even ahead of the release of the November inflation figures, India's Monetary Policy Committee had flagged off the likely rise in inflation and decided to keep policy rates unchanged. So while inflation continued to climb up, industrial production contracted by 3.8% in October. But this was actually better than the previous month's contraction of 4.3% and was also better than estimated. 32 economists polled by Bloomberg had forecast IIP to contract by 5% in October. 
18 out of 23 manufacturing industry groups saw a contraction in output. Within these, the manufacture of motor vehicles, computer, electronic and optical products saw a contraction in excess of 25%. While primary goods, capital goods and consumer durables fell to the lowest in the current series, intermediate goods continued to show a divergence and grew by 22.2%, which was the highest in the series. Whether this is an indication of a turnaround remains to be seen. And you can read uh, more details of that story, in fact, both on the IIP as well as the latest CPI data on Bloomberg Quint. Dot com. You will also find several other stories. Let me take you through a couple of them. Slowing consumption has had a bearing on the government's total tax collections and slowing goods and services tax revenue collection has in, in turn substantially increased the con compensation the central government pays to states for revenue loss on account of the nationwide implementation of the indirect tax. In April to July 2019, the centre paid states as much as 45,745 crore in compensation and that's a 143% jump over the same period last year. States have not been paid this compensation since August but uh, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman said yesterday that the centre would honour its commitment but she did not say by when the dues would be cleared. Now, audit firm Deloitte, Haskins & Sales allowed the management of ILNFS Financial Services to conceal negative capital ratios so as to save the company's NBFC license, according to the audit regulator. In its very first such audit quality review report, the National Financial uh, Reporting Authority found serious lapses in Deloitte's audit of IFIN's financial statements for financial year 2017-18. The AQR was prompted by financial troubles and allegations of mismanagement and fraud at the ILNFS group in companies or, or rather group of companies in 2018. All right, that's all you need to know going into trade today, but clearly there's lots to talk about and that'll start in just a short while. This is Bloomberg Quit.